Pipe organs have a storied history throughout Western civilization, but demand for the king of instruments has seen a steady decline in recent decades. Special correspondent Fred DeSam Lazaro reports on one attempt to change that. His report from Collegeville, Minnesota, is part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. The bells herald a new day at St. John's, a Benedictine monastic and college community nestled in 3,000 acres of lake and forest in central Minnesota. But on this September day, the attention was on sounds coming from inside the Abbey Church. It's really, really stunning what they've achieved. World-renowned organist Stephen Tharp was rehearsing for the inaugural concert on an instrument that's been newly expanded to better command its space to flood this striking, non-traditional sanctuary. And so it's kind of a surprise for people who perhaps never heard an organ recital and wonder where all of that sound and color is coming from because you can't see it. But most of what you're going to hear is behind this red scrim. I've never quite seen anything like it. I got a chance to peek behind that screen thanks to Casey Marin. All this older stuff below the, the level of the uh, second floor up there is the original organ. And uh, we, it works beautifully for what it was built to do. It just wasn't quite powerful enough for this room. A St. John's graduate and organ builder himself, Marin has maintained this one for 45 years. You can tell that's in tune. So what we ended up doing was preserving the old instrument and building upon it. And uh, the new organ kind of tops it off and gives it the extra power that it needed. Many instruments use mechanical pumps to send air through the pipes, but this one uses electronic signals. To tune it, Marin uses a phone app. Uh, on, the, on the control side of things, we're really up uh, currently with the technology. On the sound side of things, we're back centuries. The pipe organ dates back to ancient Greece, and its industrial scale evolution came long before the Industrial Revolution. In its earliest incarnations, it made more noise than pretty much anything before gunpowder. Michael Barone is a leading historian on the pipe organ and host of the weekly public radio program, Pipe Dreams. Certainly to someone who lives in the countryside, you know, a peasant, a farmer, coming into a Gothic cathedral and hearing the organ sound, uh, nothing has been comparable in their life. It is just astonishing. It's godlike. Uh, indeed, it's been thought to represent the voice of God. And the heftier the sound, the louder the voice of God, the better, he added. St. John's organ went from three manuals or keyboards to four, and from about 3,000 pipes to 6,000. A good way to look at the organ, it might be like it's a small little city of 6,000 people. It's got 6,000 pipes, and half of them were kind of homesteaders here when the church was built, and the other half came in with Martin Pozzi in the last couple of years. Thousands of pipes, every single one handcrafted by a team led by Martin Pozzi. We scrape off the paint. He's worked for three decades out of a converted two-room schoolhouse near Tacoma, Washington. The larger base or lower end pipes are milled from hardwoods. Some are as tall as 32 feet and weigh up to 850 pounds. And up the treble scale with tin and lead pipes, rolled, soldered, and tapered by hand. So now I have it ready to go on the, on the voicing track or voicing machine. Pazzi relies on electronics to confirm what his ear is telling him, that the pipe is sounding the right note. The typical organ, like the one at St. John's, takes up to two years to build, ship, and reassemble in its permanent home an exacting, increasingly rare craft. 
Only a few builders remain in business in America, most of them older, like Martin Pazzi, who trained in his native Austria before immigrating to the U.S. four decades ago. It was while he was installing the organ in Collegeville that Martin Pazzi says he had plenty of time for reflection, worrying in particular as age 70 approached about who would succeed him. And it's here that the idea first came up, why not move the whole operation to St. John's Abbey? He's pinning his hopes on a campus with hundreds of students with a long tradition of woodworking. Most of the furniture at St. John's is crafted here from the Abbey's own sustainable forests. People can come and learn the profession from the ground up, and that will make all the difference. I think, you know, somebody has not only the skill with their hands, but also an attitude, you know. A passion for a passion. the instrument? Yes, a passion the for the instrument, passion for the, for the work people do with their hands. Sometime next year, Pazzi and fellow craftsman Marcus Morsher will move into a newly expanded woodworking shop in Collegeville. Father Nick Gillespie, one of about a hundred monks at St. John's, says it's a silken glove fit. I think organ building and our commitment to music and kind of communal singing, communal music making, is an embrace of what the monastic tradition has offered for many centuries and hopefully is what sustains us going into the future. Are you ready to play, sir? I, well, as long as I'm here, sure. Oh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome tonight's featured artist, Stephen Tharp. <laughs> This concert was one kickoff event into that future. In a nod to the Benedictine tradition of Gregorian chants, he accompanied a trio of monks. Throughout the evening, Tharp brought out the impressive range and capability of the new Holtkampazi organ. in a building that defied church tradition on an instrument that's a rousing embrace of it. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Fred DeSam Lazaro in Collegeville, Minnesota. You have to be in awe of what they are doing. Thank you, Fred DeSam Lazaro. And Fred's reporting is a partnership with the Undertold Stories Project at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota.